So some of the feedback that we got last time was from people who attended, they're like, oh, I wish more people knew about this. I wish more people were in the room. I wish more people had tuned in on the webcast, although we had like 250 people, roundabouts the same as here, and about the same from all over the world tuning in online, which was awesome. And then it grew after that because we posted it. Um, but that was feedback, was the desire for more people to have an opportunity to hear from some of these incredible presenters that we're sharing with you. So if you get a chance, now is a good time because the brother we have coming up next, I will go to every single one of his talks. Every time he's presenting, even if it's exactly the same one he did before, I will go again, right? because I'm inspired every single time I hear from this brother. He carries so much love, so much fire, so much care for our people and for this struggle. And he shares that freely with us. And it's at a cost. There's a toll that it can take on you when you're living your life out loud and you're sharing, you're transforming hard experiences into understanding and sharing it back, back out with the world. That can take a toll on you. And I want to say to my brother, Dr. E.J. David, how much I appreciate the ways that you do that. You transform your understanding and your lived experience of our world and what's happening in it in a way that other people can understand it and be ignited to do something about it. An insidious part of this work is that unless you're intentional, you can go about your life with the veil, with the veil over our experience, right? It takes effort to understand the context that we're living in. How did things come to be the way that they are? I'm reading a book right now called Community Development in Action by Margaret Ledwith. And she draws heavily from Paola Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And she talks about the collective lie. The collective lie that we've come as a society to swallow and believe as the truth. That there are dominant truths that are so heavily imposed on us that they come to be known as common sense. And it's our people, people of color, who are subjugated in that, right? So I think about my brother, and we've been on this journey together for some time now. And I know for my own experience and the experience of people in my community, because we've been walking this journey together, that an important critical step to being able to transform is to first wake up, to first come to an understanding of how we came to be where we are. And a powerful way of doing that is understanding our own lived experience and the ways that these things manifest inside us. And when I think about powerful people who help others to understand that, Dr. E.J. David is nearly always the first person that I think of. And so it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you and to invite to the stage Dr. E.J. David. Please help me welcome. Good morning. 
Uh, first of all, I just um, want to say thank you to the indigenous people of these lands, um, to the Tlingit Haida Simshan people for allowing us to, to have these conversations um, here for a couple of days. Um, so in my language, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Um, I also want to pay my respects to the elders here today. I am very honored to share the same space with you all. And I also want to acknowledge all of you and all the other speakers, all the workshop facilitators. Um, thank you for all you do for our communities. I appreciate everything that you all do. And uh, I also want to thank IU for that beautiful introduction. Now she hyped me up, so I don't know if I can, <laughs> if I can live up to that hype. Um, but yes, I, I appreciate IU. IU also is, is a very amazing um, worker um, in person and just passionate about these issues as well. Um, so I appreciate her. I also want to really especially thank uh, First Alaskans Institute for putting this together and for getting all of us here together and making this happen. So please, let's, let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, I was going to put my hair up, but I decided not to. I figured I'd be a little bit more relaxed today. Um, <laughs> my wife, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about her later, but my wife is, is not here. Uh, she's watching, though, um, on the live stream, and so she'll see me with my hair down, and I hope she approves. Uh, so shout out to, to Margaret. Um, but anyway, so I, I really am, am very honored to have this opportunity to share with all of you this morning. As someone who is not indigenous to these lands, as someone who is an immigrant to these lands, I am deeply humbled and honored to be allowed to speak here today. So again, in my language, maraming maraming salamat. My name is E.J. David. I was born in the lands now known as the Philippines, which is its colonial name. So to many people, I am Filipino. But really, my people are Tagalog, which means people of the river, and Kapampangan, which means people of the riverbanks. <clears throat> Let's see if this works. There. My parents and grandparents are Tagalog and Kapampangan. And in addition to being an immigrant to these lands, I'm also married to a Koyukon Athabascan woman. And together, we have three Filipino and Athabascan children. I call them Filibascans. <laughs> and even though they're not physically here with me right now, they're always with me. My family's reality is that our lives is a product of both indigeneity and immigration, two concepts that seem opposite and irreconcilable. So it is from this perspective, as an immigrant Filipino man with an indigenous family, that I speak to you all today. As an immigrant, my first language was Tagalog. And even though I have a pretty good grasp of English, because I also grew up with that language due to American colonialism, my native language is Tagalog, and I'm lucky in that sense. I never learned Kapampangan, though, because I grew up in Metro Manila, which is a place where the legacy of colonialism persists strongly to this day, and I'll get to that here in a few minutes. So given that English is not my first language, there are still moments when my accent comes out, when, my, when I mix up my P's and my F's, um, and when I mix up my he and my she and my his, and her. Um, anyone here know Filipinos? <laughs> you probably know what I'm talking about. Go to a hospital, you'll probably hear it. <laughs> or, yeah. Um, sometimes I tell my daughter when she won't finish her food, I'll say something like, come on, come on, my daughter. Come finish your food. <laughs> Look at my daughter. He's not finishing his food. That's how I mix up my P's and my he's and my she's and my... Anyways, so that's, that's what it is. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just letting you know all of these things now in case my accent does come out. 
um, or if I mispronounce some words, or if there's something that I say that you can't understand, or if I make some grammatical mistakes. It is because I'm Filipino. It is because English is not natural to me. I want to make sure, though, that I make it clear that I'm not apologizing for them. I'm not apologizing for my mistakes. I'm just simply letting you know. And there's a reason. There's a reason why I don't say sorry for making these mistakes anymore. I used to, but not anymore. I used to be so apologetic and hard on myself for making these mistakes when I mix up my P's and my F's and my he's and she's. I used to feel so bad and embarrassed. And I was also hard on other people and other Filipinos when they make these kinds of mistakes. I teased them, I laughed at them. I didn't want to be associated with them. I, it wasn't until I became an adult and got an opportunity to learn more about my culture and our history when I realized that these mistakes were not mistakes, but instead they are little ways in which my roots are coming out of me. You see, in my indigenous language, we didn't have the F sound. We have the P sound, but not the F sound. So making the F sound was not natural to my mind and my tongue. It was not indigenous to me. So my difficulties with the F sound was my roots coming out of me. It was like my ancestors reminding me that they were still in me. The same thing with the he and the she. I used to see my mixing them up as embarrassing mistakes until I learned that in my indigenous language, we don't have male and female pronouns. We don't have separate terms for different genders. We don't have an equivalent for he, she, his, her. So gendered pronouns were not natural to me. It's not indigenous to my mind and my tongue. So me mixing them up wasn't a mistake. Instead, it was my roots coming out of me. It was my ancestors reminding me that they still exist within me. I shouldn't be embarrassed when I mix them up. Instead, I should be proud that my roots and my ancestors are still so strongly embedded in me that they come out and emanate from me, even when I try to hide them, even when this world had tried to systematically erase them. My accent and my grammatical mistakes are proof that my roots and my peoples are resilient and that they are still here. My peoples are here despite hundreds of years of colonialism. So let me step back a little bit here and tell you a little bit about my people's colonial history. And in the process, let you know a little bit more about me. And I will do this by sharing a few stories. So here's my first one. <clears throat> it's actually a Lyft ride. I don't use Uber. I use Lyft. But I figure more people know what Uber is than Lyft. So, so a few months ago, uh, I went down to San Francisco for a conference. And I landed at the airport, and I decided to take a lift from the airport to the conference venue. And, you know, I, my driver got there, and I got into his car, and I sat down, and, you know, and then he started asking me a few questions, you know, like typical chit-chat, you know, when you meet a stranger. And eventually, we got to this particular question. He asked me, where are you from? I said, Seattle because I did. I flew from Anchorage to Seattle to San Francisco, right? So I said, I'm from Seattle. And then he said, no, 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 no. Where are you really from? So I'm like, wow, how come he knew that I did not really come from Seattle? <laughs> okay? And so I'm like, okay, well, fine, I'll be honest. I, I came from Alaska. Um, and he's like, no, 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 no. Where are you really from? And so at that point, you know, this is not the first time I've been asked the where are you really from question. So at this point, I knew what he wanted to know. He wanted to know what my ethnicity was. And so I told him, I'm Filipino. But, you know, what I really wanted to tell him was that how offensive he was for asking me where I really was from. Um, what I really wanted to tell him was that, would you ask the same question if I was a white person? What I really wanted to do was tell him off. But I didn't want to do that. I 
because I just wanted to get out of there. I just wanted it to end. And so I gave him what I knew he wanted. I told him I was Filipino. And then he said, oh, okay. Were you born there? Did you grow up there? And I said, yeah, I did. And then he said, oh, so what made you want to come to this country? He asked me, why did you come here? You know, and for many immigrants, the easy answer to this question is that we came here for a better life. The answer tends to satisfy whoever is asking the question. And because I really did not want to have any conversation with this man anymore, I just wanted to end it. I gave him this answer. I said, I came to America for a better life. You see, the reason why this answer satisfies many Americans is because it fits their worldview, their belief, perhaps their delusion. They believe that life in America is better than anywhere else in the world. And so by telling them that I came here for a better life, it automatically makes sense to them. They believe that life in other parts of the world can no way be better than life in America. This is why this answer automatically makes sense to many people. But you know what I really wanted to tell him? What I really wanted to tell him in response to his why did I come here question was that I'm here because when I was four years old, my father left us, his family that he loves, for a better life here in America. What I really wanted to tell him was that when I was six years old, I fell in love with G.I. Joe toys. And every month, my mom would take me to a store in the Philippines to buy me a G.I. Joe action figure. And every time she would try to buy me a G.I. Joe action figure, she would try to bargain for a lower selling price. And my mom is the best bargainer in the world. But she would always lose to the clerk because the clerk would always tell her, but ma'am, you can't sell these things for lower because these are made in the USA. And so then the messages that I got from these experiences every month was that anything that was made in the USA was better than anything that was made in the Philippines. And that anything that was made in the Philippines was of poor quality and for the poor. And that anything that was made in the USA is better. What I wanted to tell my Lyft driver was that when I was 11 years old and I developed my first crush ever on this neighborhood girl, that's me wearing the number nine basketball jersey. And that's not really the girl I had a crush on. But I found this photo, and I'm not even sure if I was 11. So, um, <laughs> and I went, I went, I went, I went, I ran over to my sister, my older sister. She's about, you know, six years older than me. And I said, hey, you know, I think I like so-and-so. And she was like, oh, okay. Well, here's what you need to do to make her like you. You need to go to our bathroom, go into the medicine cabinet, and start using that bleach in there to whiten your skin. The message I received was that for me to become attractive, I needed to get rid of my brown skin. And this is not just from my sister. This, is, was, this, this, this message came from many people in many um, um, contexts in the Philippines. In the Philippines, it's common to see skin whitening clinics and skin whitening products being sold and advertised to everybody, like lotions and soaps and even pills. Today, you can even get an IV drip to whiten your skin in the Philippines. What I wanted to tell my Lyft driver is that I'm here because all of my years going to school in the Philippines, I was taught that English is the language of the educated. What I wanted to tell him was that I'm here because my parents and my grandparents were taught that America is the land of milk and honey, that it is the promised land and the land of opportunities. What I wanted to tell my Lyft driver was that I'm here because when I was only 14 years old and my brother was eight, my mother sacrificed and put her two young children on a plane to cross the Pacific Ocean, not knowing if she will ever see them again. Because she believed that there were no opportunities for us in our homeland, and that there are more opportunities for us here in America. 
I wanted to tell my Lyft driver that I'm here because my mother made the sacrifice of sending her two children away to go to a place she had never seen and didn't know if she will ever see because of a dream and a belief that life here is better. I am here because America colonized my homelands and took our resources. I am here because of US colonialism, of cultural genocide and racism. I am here because America exploited and inferiorized my peoples. America and its leaders saw my peoples as savages, as children who were incapable of self-government. America saw my peoples and they thought that it was their benevolent duty to educate us and to Christianize us and to civilize us. I am here because America taught me that my language and my worldview and my culture and ways of doing things are not as civilized as the American way. I am here because America taught me that anything American is superior to anything Filipino. I am here because America taught me that coming to America is our measure of ultimate success. <sighs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> Here are some political cartoons showing you America's effort to civilize my peoples. Here's a, this, this cartoon shows a missionary uh, trying to, to teach this quote unquote old savage. You may realize this old savage may kind of look like Mark Twain, um, but that's not by accident. Mark Twain was, was known as a Filipino sympathizer at that time because he was very critical of America's imperialist efforts. Um, here's a Filipino being uh, treated or portrayed as a, as a child needing to be trained by, by Uncle Sam. A Filipino savage child being given his first bath by President William McKinley using the waters of civilization and the brush of education. Filipinos before and after to convince American people that America has a benevolent mission in the Philippines and it's needed that America was there to civilize us. Um, and not only that, uh, to further convince Americans that, Ameri that the United States has a benevolent mission in the Philippines, they brought, as you can see right here, um, 700 or actually 1,200 native Filipinos from the Philippines and brought them to St. Louis, Missouri for the 1904 World's Fair. And they were told to build their authentic Filipino dwellings in there. This is a poster for this essentially human zoo. Just more political cartoons showing the same thing. What I wanted to tell my Lyft driver was that I'm here because America exploited my homelands and my peoples and took our resources, making living and surviving in my homelands difficult. I'm here because America exploited my homelands and my peoples and took our resources to make life in America better. I'm here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. What I wanted to tell my, my Lyft driver was that I'm here because America was there. I am here because America colonized my lands, my peoples, my minds, and my heart. What I wanted to tell him was that even though my country ended being a colony, does not mean that colonization stopped. Just because our colonizers left doesn't mean that the legacy and stench of colonialism also went away. As Frantz Fanon said, imperialism leaves behind germs of rot, which we must clinically detect and remove from our land, but from our minds as well. What I wanted to tell him was that America left germs of rot that has been causing my people devastation for generations now. So yes, I am here because America colonized my peoples and left our minds and lands rotting. And I am not unique. My peoples are not unique. There are many other people who are here from different parts of the world, and they're also here because America made life in their homelands difficult. They are here because America took away their resources or meddled in their affairs in one form or another. We need to see these links 
between us. Those of, our, who are immig- those of us who are immigrants here need to see the links between ourselves, and all of us need to see our similar struggles under American colonialism and imperialism. As Asata, Asata Shakur said, any community seriously concerned with its own freedom has to be concerned about other people's freedom as well. The victory of oppressed people anywhere in the world is a victory for all oppressed people. Each time one of imperialism's tentacles is cut off, we are closer to liberation. Imperialism is an international system of exploitation, and we, as revolutionaries, need to be internationalists to defeat it. To be revolutionaries, we must see the connections between our communities and we must work together. Those of us who are not indigenous to these lands, as much as we advocate for immigrant rights, we need to stop saying things like immigrants make America great, or America is a land of immigrants. These things are simply not true and further propagates the myth that America was discovered by white people. We cannot advocate for immigrant rights at the expense of further erasing the indigenous peoples of these lands. And those of us who are born here, maybe even indigenous here, we should also remember that many immigrants are here because America was there. Immigrants are here because America colonized other countries or interfered with other countries or took other countries' resources and exploited their people. We need to see these similarities between our experiences and our struggles. And here, as we can see with immigration and indigeneity, even between two seemingly irreconcilable things, two seemingly complete opposites, we see that there are links. Which brings me to my next story. (laughs) Standing Rock interview. So back in November 2016, During the height of the Standing Rock movement, my wife and I uh, joined our people over there. And because of my involvement there, some Filipino-American media wanted to know more about my experiences there and, you know, just learn more about what was happening there. So they asked me many questions, um, but one question stood out. They asked me, why do you care about Standing Rock? Why should Filipinos care? about Standing Rock. Now, other generic answers came to mind for why I went there, like the movement in Standing Rock is about clean water, clean energy, and the environment. But what I ended up sharing with the media was that we should never forget that fighting over 500 years of colonialism, genocide, and racism are huge parts of the Standing Rock movement, too. And so I told them that I went there to resist oppression. As a Filipino immigrant, as a settler in these lands, I went to Standing Rock because the same idea of manifest destiny that was used to steal lands from our native brothers and sisters is the same manifest destiny that was used to justify the colonization of my peoples. I went there because the same notion of benevolent assimilation wherein our native brothers and sisters were forced to attend boarding schools to erase their culture was the same benevolent assimilation that was used to miseducate Filipinos and inculcate Filipinos with notions of American superiority. Here are some links showing you the similarities between the Filipino and uh, Native American experience. Here's a uh, cartoon showing a Native American man telling a Filipino man and a Hawaiian uh, woman, um, I see your finish. Here's another one. Um, Here's a Native man talking to a Filipino person over the telegraph saying, be good or you will be dead. And you can see Hawaii waiting in the background there. Um, I told you about the 1904 World's Fair in Missouri, um, but not very far from here. In 1909, during the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition in Seattle, they brought Filipinos there too, similar to what they did in St. Louis, Missouri, but they also brought um, Alaska Natives uh, down there to be shown off to the American people. Here are some photos of it, of the villages that they were told to build in the expo. Here's a Filipino and native child 
together during the same expo in 1909. Uh, Filipinos' uh, children uh, being watched by Americans at the expo. Here's more photos of that. <clears throat> so I went to Standing Rock because as an immigrant, I acknowledge that I'm not indigenous to these lands. In fact, many of my four million peoples are recent immigrants to these lands. So it is important that I pay respect to the indigenous peoples of these lands, empathize with them, and stand with them as they continue to resist the colonization of their lands and the oppression of their culture. I went there because my peoples share a similar struggle with our native brothers and sisters today in terms of fighting against con continued colonialism, cultural genocide, and racism. I went there because I now see the truth that my struggles for equality as an immigrant person of color is tied to, perhaps even dependent on, my native brothers and sisters' quest for equality in their own ancestral lands. Because how can I, an immigrant to these lands, how can I expect to be treated with equality and humanity if those who are actually from these lands are oppressed? This is why I went to Standing Rock. This is why I work with First Alaskans. Some photos. <laughs> They're great people. Um, this is why I helped um, with making sure that our state officially recognizes and celebrates Indigenous Peoples Day, which is coming up in a few weeks here. We need immigrant indigenous solidarity now and for the next 10,000 years. As a Filipino person, you know, my peoples have a long and rich history in Alaska and with Alaska's indigenous people. And I think Juneau is a great place uh, to see that. Um, my people today, uh, like historically, for example, there are records of Filipinos landing in what is now known as Alaska, going all the way back to 1788. And not too far from here, there, were, there are records, historical records of Filipinos landing in Yakutat Bay as early as 1791. So, so it's long, yeah? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, there you go. Um, and today, today, you know, my peoples today compose the largest immigrant group in Alaska. So I believe my people, as the largest immigrant group in the state, we have the responsibility to work with our indigenous communities. And actually all of us who are not indigenous to these lands, we have a responsibility to work in collaboration and in solidarity with our native brothers and sisters in ensuring that these lands stay strong, that these lands stay healthy, and that these lands stay welcoming. We need to respect these lands. And the most important way, I think, to respect these lands is by connecting with our indigenous communities and working with them to make sure that injustice and oppression do not happen in these lands. Now this, yeah, so we must fight oppression, which brings me to my next story. I thought about reinventing the wheel. There's this one TV show that I watch. Um, it's about lawyers, and the lead character is a woman. And in one of the episodes, uh, there was a, like a scene where she was working with a panel of, of nine judges, and all of the judges were male, and she's the only woman in this committee, and all of the other judges who were part of the committee have been part of this before, so they've done this before, and the woman is the only new person in this committee. This is her first time deliberating a case with them, you know, and so as they were hearing evidence for this case and hearing testimony, all the other judges just you know, keep passing on their opportunities to ask questions. Like somebody will ask them, Judge A, do you have a question? Be like, no. Judge B, you have a question? No. Okay. They're just going through the motions. They've seen this before. You know, they were just doing the same thing that they've done many other times before. So the woman lawyer, however, was the only one asking questions and actually was kind of, you know, quote unquote, disruptive, according to the judges. And so after one of their meetings, one of the judges took the woman lawyer aside and talked with her. 
And he said, you know, you don't need to try to impress us. And the woman lawyer said, I'm not trying to impress you. And then the judge said, well, then you don't need to keep asking those questions. Just follow the procedures. Go through the motions. We've done this before. It works. You don't need to keep asking questions, even challenging some of the decisions. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's a wheel. It works, he said. Right? So, <laughs> see, many of us in this room, you know, have heard that saying, don't reinvent the wheel. And for the most part, it's well-intentioned. And for many cases, the wheel does work. But for all of us here, as people who care about social justice and who are fighting for social justice in our communities, we know that there are many wheels that don't work. In fact, many of us know that many wheels have been oppressive. In fact, many of us know that the wheel has been running us over. So oppression is the issue. Oops, sorry. Research is quite clear on this, right? Racism is related to poor mental health and well-being for peoples of color. Sexism is related to poor well-being among women. Homophobia is related to poor well-being among LGBTQ people. Anti-immigration attitudes related to more stress levels among um, immigrant people. So it's clear. Oppression negatively affects the lives and well-being of people. It is not surprising then that those of us who have been historically and contemporarily oppressed because of our culture, race, ethnicity, the color of our skin, our gender, our sexual orientation, where we were born, we tend to experience higher levels of this and that. It is not surprising that we face so many issues in our communities. It is not surprising that oppressed groups tend to have higher rates of various health and social problems. And this is not because we are inherently inferior or weaker. This is not because there's something wrong with us. This is not because we are not resilient enough. We need to be clear here. We have these problems in our communities because of oppression, because of oppressive wheels. Now I wanna say something here real quick. Whenever I talk about oppression, colonialism and modern day oppression, Many people always say something like, you paint people as victims who have no control over their lives. People always criticize me for this, for focusing on oppression and for focusing on the issues that we face in our communities, telling me instead that we're resilient people. I know that. I, need, I really need to clarify almost every time that I never have doubted people's resilience and the ability to control their own lives. In fact, it is colonialism and oppression that does that. Colonialism and oppression inferiorizes people. Colonialism and oppression regard people as incapable. Nevertheless, historically oppressed groups have continued to survive despite systematic oppression. People, our people, have proven our resiliency over and over again for generations. So resiliency is not the issue. Oppression is. We don't need to keep proving how resilient we are. The world needs to stop oppressing us. And we must also remember that our resiliency is not permission for others to keep oppressing us. Let me go off script here for a minute now that I'm really talking about oppression. And also, given recent news about the continued oppression of our native sisters and daughters, I feel like I need to share something to you all, especially to the men in this room and to the men who are watching in the internet world. And to do this, I want to read a few passages uh, from my book. Uh, the passages are from a letter that I wrote uh, to my Philebaskin sons. But I want to share this to all of the men here today and everyone listening. Although, although this was written to my sons, I think it pertains to all men, including me. Um, so, so here it is. <clears throat> In addition to how historical colonialism and contemporary racism may damage you and how you in turn may damage yourself, 
you also need to understand that past and modern day oppression can lead you to hurt other people. My sons, historical colonialism and contemporary oppression have beaten you down and it will continue to beat you down as Filipino and native men. The past and current devaluation of your humanity may contribute to your sense of inferiority. And you need to understand how such insecurities may lead you to lash out at those who remind you of your alleged worthlessness, those who you perceive to be less powerful than you. So you, you need to resist violence against other native people. You need to resist violence against other Filipino people. You need to resist violence against women and children. Research shows disturbingly high rates of intimate partner violence and child abuse among our communities. And in many of these cases, the perpetrators of violence and abuse are men. And there's also the epidemic of sexual assault and abuse, a large percentage of which are committed by men against women and children. In our home state of Alaska, the rate of reported sexual assault has continued to grow over the past 50 years to our current level of nearly three times the national average. And these are just the reported cases. Research shows that at least 60% of all sexual assaults go unreported. And don't ever think that people who are victimized by violence and abuse are asking for it or that they deserve it. It's not their fault. It is never their fault. Never believe the victim blaming narrative that is perpetuated by this society. How victims were behaving and what they were wearing and what they were drinking and what they were saying and whether or not they were walking alone in a dangerous neighborhood and whether or not the victim has a past and whether or not the victim has self-defense training does not matter. There is no clear consistency among intimate partner violence victims or sexual assault victims to suggest that the cause of their victimization resides with them. There is no common factor among the victims to legitimately conclude that they are to blame for their own victimization. Instead, in all intimate partner violence and sexual assault cases, the only common factor is that there is an attacker. And most of the time, the attacker is a man. And research suggests that sexual assault and rape and intimate partner violence is almost always driven by the desire or need of the perpetrator to maintain, obtain, or retain power and control. My sons, please do not buy into this toxic type of masculinity. You are not entitled to have power or control over anyone. You do not have to dominate anyone to be a complete man or to be a complete person or to prove anything to anybody. You do not have to validate violence or show a potential to commit violence in order to be respected. Do not view women, LGBTQ people, and other peoples of color, human beings that this world will try to convince you to see as inferior, as inherently being less than you. My sons, it's completely okay to be afraid to admit weakness, to be caring, soft, tender, and vulnerable. These do not make you less of a man. Instead, they complete you as a human. You need to understand toxic masculinity and identify it when you see it so that you can protect yourself from acquiring it. Toxic masculinity is harmful not only in terms of how you see yourself as a person, but it is also deadly in terms of how you regard and interact with other people in this world. My sons, I understand that this world has and will continue to try to emasculate you, challenge you, anger you, agitate you, and force you to react violently, especially toward those who this world prescribes as less powerful. The oppressive systems in this world will try to convince you that the source of your problems is the other oppressed groups in society instead of oppression itself. This is how racism intersects with sexism and other forms of social group of oppression. I understand that for many generations now, this world has taken so much of your power, but you must resist 
And always remember that exerting abuse and power over the marginalized and vulnerable, or anyone for that matter, does not make you more powerful. Please, my sons, don't try to reclaim your power this way. So everyone, the wheel has been turning and turning and turning. And it has been running over us in our communities for generations now. The wheel has been oppressive. The wheel has been destructive. We must stop asking people to be simply strong and resilient against an oppressive wheel. Instead, we must stop the wheel. <laughs> We must throw it away. Sorry about my animation here. Um, and we must reinvent it. We must invent a wheel that works for all people. We don't need a wheel that works only for some people. We don't need a wheel that benefits only some people by exploiting others. We must invent a wheel that works for all of us. Let's make a wheel that is more attuned to and responsive to and effective for our communities. And this is why we must focus on oppression and continue to fight oppression. The wheel that is in operation right now is not the wheel that our ancestors created. This oppressive system is not the system of our ancestors. In fact, this wheel, this system, is the wheel that ran over our ancestors. It is the system that oppressed them. It is the system that our ancestors resisted and fought against. So what we all do as social justice doers Fighting oppression is honoring our ancestors because we are continuing their fight. This is really the main reason I do what I do today. As a colonized man, I do this because I want to help my ancestors and continue their fight to help them heal. So not only are all of us linked because we are experiencing similar struggles and because we are resisting similar oppressive systems, we are also linked because our ancestors fought the same oppressive systems. Our ancestors are also linked to each other, just like all of us are linked to each other today. Now, I understand this is heavy, um, and that's okay. Um, it's okay to be angered by oppression, by generations and generations of it. It's normal to be saddened by it, to be devastated by it. We must always be affected by an oppressive world. As Asata Shakur said, people get used to anything. The less you think about oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. After a while, people just think that oppression is the normal state of things. But to become free, you have to be acutely aware of being a slave. We must never become desensitized or numb to oppression. We must never accept it. It's completely normal and valid to feel devastated by something so violent and so wrong. It is normal and necessary to be bothered and distressed by generations of destruction. This is hard work because we are working toward healing our ancestors and healing ourselves. This is hard work because it involves the healing of our hearts. This is hard work because this is our hearts work. And this is why it is even more important to see the links between our communities so that we remember that we are not alone in this battle. And if we see the truth that all of us are linked together in this struggle, then we become more powerful. Then add on the truth that our ancestors are also linked with each other and to us and that they have our backs, then we realize that we have superpowers. We are never alone. Anyone here know Voltus V? No? I guess that's just the Filipino in me who grew up in the Philippines. But anyway, Voltus V, it was a cartoon uh, that I grew up watching in the Philippines. And there were five of them, uh, heroes, I guess. And in the beginning of each episode, they would try to fight the enemy as, as individuals. And eventually, they will all lose. But by the end of each episode, they always end up coming together. And their catchphrase 
when it's time to come together was, let's vote in. The catchphrase of let's vote in would be called out when the team would finally unite together and merge into one giant robot. You see the robot there a little bit. Um, to, to defeat this monster alien <laughs> that they're trying to fight, right? But, you know, so for us, I think this, this, this metaphor applies. If we, because, you know, we need to vote in, but we're trying to be revolutionaries, so for us, it's, it's re-voting in. <laughs> so, so, so in short, right? It would be like collaborating and congregating people from different backgrounds and walks of life into one powerful entity with all of us together, plus all of our ancestors together. We can stop this oppressive wheel. <laughs> I mean, look at that, right? Look at that. Look at us. That's us, right? <laughs> what chance does an oppressive wheel have against that? Yeah? With all of us together, we can, we must stop the wheel and invent a new wheel, a wheel that is fair and just and equitable. So yes, when we see our links, we become more powerful. And when we look into our past and harness the strength of our ancestors, we become even more powerful. And you know what else can make us even more powerful? The young people. We become powerful by connecting with the past and also by connecting with our future. And the importance of empowering the next generation brings me to my last story. So just last week, my youngest child, who is in kindergarten right now, had his first official school picture day. Um, so to him, it was, it was a special day. And for school picture day, he insisted on wearing a barong Tagalog, which is similar to what I'm wearing here now. Right, this is uh, one of the traditional clothing of, uh, of the Philippines, uh, specifically the Tagalog people. Okay? So here's what he looked like for his school picture day. Okay? That's him. Right? Look how proud he is right? and so happy to be rocking that barong. Right? Uh, so I didn't bring up the idea. I didn't even mention this at all to him. It was all him. It was a special day right? when his photograph would be taken. And they, you know, his teachers told him that. And so then his first automatic thought was, I must wear a barong Tagalog. This is normal for him. You know, that's just how his mind and his heart is naturally shaped right now. And that's amazing. You see, when I was young, I didn't have the courage to wear a barong Tagalog in the U.S. school system. I didn't have pride. I was worried that people would tease me and make fun of me. My mind and heart was shaped to automatically be ashamed and embarrassed of my culture. My mind and my heart was shaped to automatically second guess, rethink, and hide my roots. And it's amazing that in some small way, things seem to be different for my son. So it is very powerful for me to see this because it tells me that the little things that I do is making some effect. You see, I fight against oppression today so that my children can be proud of their culture, of their roots, of their heritage. And I know that I'm able to fight against oppression today because I learned that my ancestors also fought against oppression. So just like our ancestors made it clear to us that they fought, we need to make it clear to the next generation that we also fought. And as a parent of Filibaskan children, I do this because I want to set a good example for my children to help them heal too. And this experience about my son is just a little example of how it is possible for this healing to happen, for intergenerational healing to happen. As Grandma Rita Blumenstein said, we are our ancestors. And when we heal ourselves, we also heal our ancestors, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, and our children. When we heal ourselves, we heal Mother Earth. And this is why we must show our children, perhaps even involve our children, in our resistance against oppression, 
so that hopefully they won't be run over by the same oppressive wheel that ran over their ancestors. At the very least, I hope that they will at least see that their ancestors and their parents fought against this oppressive wheel. So that when the next generation looks back at us and try to find out what we did, they can be proud of us. So that when the next generation looks at us, they will see that their ancestors fought against oppression. It's very important. Listen up, everybody. History has its eyes on us right now. How do we look? I'm going to repeat that again. History has its eyes on us. How do we look? One very important thing we can do right now so that history will show that we did something to disrupt the wheel is to support and lift up our young people. We need to tell them and show them that their roots is their strength. We need to tell our children that their cultures, their languages, their perspectives, their worldviews, their dreams are all sources of strength. We must tell children that their roots is their superpower. So to the children here tonight, there's a few. I saw a couple earlier. Your roots, your culture is your superpower. Make sure you don't lose it. There'll be times when this world will pressure you to lose your culture. There'll be people who will tease you, make fun of your accent, make fun of your values, your food, your languages. Please resist them. Do not give in. Remember that you have your ancestors and they got your backs. And so yes, your culture and your roots is your superpower and make sure you use it for good because just because you have superpowers doesn't mean that you are superheroes. To be a superhero, you need to use your superpowers for good. So please use your superpower for good. Use your culture to make our communities, our world, a better place. And to all of us here, we must use our roots to empower our children. And when our children are empowered, when our youth are empowered, then intergenerational healing will happen. When our youth are empowered and when they are healing, then our communities will be powerful. And when our youth believe that they matter, then our communities will matter, our perspectives will be valued, and our voices will be heard. When our young people are allowed to dream, and when we help our young people achieve their dreams, then our communities will be strong. When our young people harness their superpowers, and when they believe that they are capable of doing great things, like stopping an oppressive wheel, interrupting it, breaking it apart, and inventing better equitable wheels, then our communities will be healthy. Thank you all so much. Maraming maraming salamat. Gunal Shish. Thank you for hearing me out. Totally lived up to the hype, huh? And then some, can we give him another round of applause? <laughs> Brother, I learn from you every single time. I, um, you know, we get the opportunity to be in front of groups of people quite, quite often. And I'm really thankful for his teachings and the ways that he shares our experience because it helps not only me understand my own experience and therefore how can I help others understand. He has a very powerful way of contextualizing and deconstructing some of those dominant truths that we talked about earlier. Particularly one that has resonated so much with me recently is around your teachings on resilience because we see this all the time, glorifying the resilience that we have as indigenous people, as people of color, and that's true. 
I appreciate the way that he powerfully, clearly says, our resilience has never been in question. The fact that we are here today strong proves that fact. We have to understand what is it about our world that requires our resilience? What is it about the systems that we're in that are requiring that we be resilient to make it through, right? That's where our focus needs to be. I appreciate that teaching from him. I also wanted to call attention to something that he kind of skipping stoned over in his presentation, and, and that is around Indigenous Peoples Day. So a couple years ago, he reached out to First Alaskans Institute and said, you know what, Columbus Day is coming up. Alaska as a state, by the way, does not recognize, officially recognize Columbus Day as a state. It's a federal holiday, but not a state holiday. He reached out and he said, ah, Columbus Day is coming up. I really feel like we need to do something. We need to do something. And at the time, we were kind of full court press, getting ready for elders and youth. It wasn't something we were able to put a lot of time and energy into. And we're like, what do you want to do, brother? We want to support you. And he's like, I feel like maybe we should see if the mayor and the governor would be interested in acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day on Columbus Day in Alaska. And we're like, cool, how can we support you? He's like, I'll get back to you. So he comes back with a drafted proclamation recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day for Alaska. When we talk about social justice doers, we're talking about things like that, right? Our Filipino brother saying Alaska needs to, to do a better job acknowledging, recognizing, and honoring our indigenous people, and I'm gonna help do that. Not many people know that that was him. So I wanna take a moment and honor EJ for helping set that in motion because now, a couple years later, we can say Alaska officially recognizes Indigenous Peoples Day in perpetuity now. And it started from that, that space. So if we could please acknowledge EJ for that. <laughs> He's like, why are you clapping for me? Acknowledging your role in creating Indigenous Peoples Day for Alaska, the first state to officially recognize it wholesale. There are a lot of cities. Um, there are a lot of there were a lot of efforts all over the state with school districts, Nome, Sitnasalk, and others here in Juneau, UAS. I know a lot of efforts were made. Um, within our different communities to help that make that happen. So I wanted to acknowledge that um, and honor it. And also to pick up on the healing that he spoke of. The healing that he spoke of at the end, which is so beautiful. When you posted that picture of Kalu on, the, on picture day, I cried. It's so beautiful. Sometimes we see the healing of our people in real time, and that's a beautiful thing. We were recently on Prince of Wales Island, and, and we were doing a, a tribal court circle peacemaking training, and Uncle Mike Jackson of Kihkwan shared this, which I want to gift to you because I received it as a gift. He said, when our people are fully restored to who we really are, it will be as though we have been for all time. Our healing will be that profound and complete. That's what we're working toward. Yeah? We would like to create a little bit of a space at your tables to spend a few minutes being able to talk with one another about some of the things that we heard and reflect for a few minutes, just kind of hear from each other. What did you, what did you hear? What did you receive from what has been shared so that we can learn from each other? Yeah, at our tables. We'll do this for just a few minutes and then I'll invite Klinmugu and or Agathuk up to help lead us into our workshop sessions. 
Okay, but for right now, let's just spend a few minutes kind of reflecting on some of the things that we heard and gained from that experience. Hi, everyone. So I really appreciated yesterday when we had a chance to hear back from some of your table discussions. So if there's anyone who wants to share anything profound that was shared, some of your insight, your response to what we've heard this morning, uh, we'd love to hear from you before we move on with our workshops. So IU has a, a microphone. Just raise your hand if you're interested in sharing some of your reflections back. So Keith Morrison, uh, one of the things that we touched on that we appreciated um, Dr. David saying was just simply that um, we have to really be clear about what we're fighting against and what we're building up. And so this uh, truth about um, we don't need to or we don't, it's not a requirement to hyper-focus on resiliency. It's, this is happening in the mental health field right now. This is happening in the school systems right now. Resiliency, resiliency, resiliency. Instead of raising up kids who are going to fight oppression, raising up kids who are going to um, become that clinician or that mental health professional who focuses on true healing, deep healing, um, not short interventions. Um, so if we really are uh, looking to build something like in perpetuity, something with a 10,000 year vision, um, we have to really be clear uh, what we're fighting. Koyana. I love that. Melissa Johnson, Kitchigan. And one thing that I realized is using our muscle to speak truth, I guess. So when I think about, like we have, which I call Native in November school board meeting out in the Native communities, instead of using that as something where we show our beautiful culture and dance, but use the microphone to address issues that need to be addressed in a very kind, eloquent way. And I think listening to the two different speakers is their ability to use their words in a nice, way I come across pretty probably aggressive. I mean, that's just my personality. Very competitive, to the point, super fast, super loud, and sometimes you have to find a place where you can speak truth, but do it in a place not of anger, but of advocacy. And so I always have a difficult time with that of, am I aggressive and angry, or am I being an advocate, and how do you, how do you change from being angry to an advocate. So those are what I learned listening to those two people. Koyanak, um, I would add to that and say yes, and we need help with more people helping to rise up against the tone police, the ones who will say, I'm not gonna hear you because you're angry right now and it's offending me. It's making me uncomfortable because you're angry because our anger is justified. If you don't know that, if you don't feel that, receive that from me right now. Our anger, our hurt, our grief, being pissed, being hurt, is justified, right? The more that you learn, the more that you know. There's a reason that we feel these things. It's normal and it's okay, right? In some spaces, it requires that we put on a way of saying things a certain way to be effective. Our people who can, in their fire, say things in another way, we need that too. And when you hear people who try to push down the expression of our anger and our hurt, we need more people to step up and say, uh-uh, it's okay that they're angry. Of course they're angry. Why aren't you angry? 
right? We need more people helping to say that anger is justified. Let's do something about it instead of the collateral damage continuing to be us having to swallow it because that hurts us. Yeah? So it's both. Hawaii J. David, for your wonderful words. They're very healing when we put these types of stories out there and we can share our own stories as best we can. And my mother was a boarding school child and when she was about 86 years old I got up enough nerve to ask her, because I was doing a research, what happened to you while you were at boarding school? And she said, I can tell you the physical things they did to me, but I'm still dealing with the mental things that they made me feel. And then she started to cry. She went to boarding school when she was 10 years old with only speaking Haida. So, Hawa, for sharing your story. So my mom, I could share my mom's because uh, she couldn't put words to it. In my culture, it's very important when we talk that we stand up. I I, it's really a stretch for me to to speak publicly, but I have to say thank you to our friend, our brother here, for his heartfelt presentation. It didn't reach my brain, but it touched my heart. And when you touched my heart, you touched my spirit. I take care of ancestors, and I came to this conference just to hear this presentation because of your title, with the ancestors. And I felt a lot of pain from ancestors in the past, from my work. And I realized today that my ancestors reached out to me, but I also realized that pain that they suffered is not my pain. And it's up to me to, to decide what to do with it. So I'm going to say this. I spent a year in Europe. And when I went over there, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to meet those people. I didn't want to know them. But the elder who talked to me, he said, what an opportunity you have to meet a new people. You should go. And I went, and I was so surprised that I met Celtic people. I met gypsies. 
I met Norwegian Laplanders, Irish, Scottish, and they all had an ancient history. And it really made me feel that I was beginning to forgive them and get to know them. And I changed and became a better person. And I guess that resilience, to me, it stopped yesterday. And I tried a new fruit today. <laughs> I never tried this fruit before. It's like an onion <laughs> that has a lot of layers. And all these layers were being peeled off of me. And there was a nut in the middle. <laughs> and they told me not to chew it. But this nut in your presentation, this seed, is going to germinate. So those of you who are immigrants, those of you who are from Europe, if I can forgive you, then you can set aside your guilt. I've learned forgiveness, and I've gone on to be the human being I, as a Tlingit person, was intended to be. And those of you who are immigrants, you can set aside your guilt and you can go on to be the human beings you were intended to be. My grandchildren are mixed, but I tell them there's no such thing as mix. We are all human beings. And my daughter is very proud to be Tlingit. My grandchildren, I have a new grandson and another one coming. So I just want to introduce myself to my brother over there who has shared his wisdom for us to become a better human beings. Because it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. When we get our power back, everybody gets their power back. So I just want to say thank you. I, I've been a quiet guy for a long time, and when I get the mic, I, it's hard to give it up. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you to the elders. When you mentioned elders, I looked around. Where's the elders? <laughs> I didn't look in the mirror. <laughs> and I'm a new, I'd like to say, I am a new upcoming elder. So I'm just like a little kid, same as a small child. And so I just want to say thank you to First Alaskans for bringing the best out of me. Thank you. Oh, OK. Uh, let's do two more. Oh, there's, well, I don't want, I can't, I can't say two more, but let's, hold on, let's take a moment. Remember our agreement to value each other's time, because I want to hear from more people, but we want to make sure that we get to hear from all the folks who want to share. Okay, can you help us with that? Uh, my name is Kevin McGee, and yesterday, because of my friend, I actually had a life-changing experience with the smudging. 
I had been holding in for 34 years the sexual assault that occurred to my daughter when she was 12. That burden, I still remember and always will, but to me it felt like it was lifted because I had been holding that in for 34 years. Something that obviously as a father I never forget, but I'm gonna always be sure that I love my children and they know that, they know that their father loves them. And thank you, it helped. My name is Leona Santiago. On I'm Clinkett. I'm an elder, and I am Caguantan, which is wolf, and I come from the wolf house, which is Gooch Hit. My mother, <clears throat> my mother's family comes from Haines and Clacuan, and um, in the Clinkett tribe, we we follow our mother's lineage. And my father was from Huna. So I'm a um, descendant of Glacier Bay, which is also uh, Huna Kawu. You brought out a lot of feelings sharing your history and goodness cheese for taking us through your life and it brought a lot of feelings out in me that I haven't because I think all our struggles are all the same and It's really good. I know when I saw your son wearing the shirt that our our young people, our pride, have a lot of pride in their culture. And I as a As a cultural leader and a song and dance leader, I, I really praise our young people. And it's really good to really good to sit here and, and see the allies we have with each other. Um uh, my husband's from Mexico, so I really identify with what what was shared because as an immigrant, you really have to work ten times harder than everybody else just to exist. And I've been profiled in, by TSA and everything because of, of my last name, Santiago. But the fact that you went to Standing Rock, goodness, cheesh, goodness, cheesh, for talking about Native people.
missed you, Shleona. Um, EJ, I, uh, I just would be remiss if the time passed without um, at least one immigrant Asian standing to give you a public thanks for your presentation, um, because I think you spoke not only to intergenerational healing, but to intergenerational solidarity. And that's really going to stay with me for a long time. So, kamsanda. Anyat Kusani. I wanted you to hear our ancestral language. And some people may say Anyat Kusani is the children of the land. But it's a ceremonial word, and it's children who come from honorable parents. Anyat Kusani, E.J. Davis, David, Gunal Chish, Gunal Chish, Iyo Katangi, Jasak Tuasigu, Iyakto, Ya Hashukokao, Iyo Katangi, Ha. Thank you so much for sharing, and I wanted you to hear our language spoken. Ya hat at ki aya, tlinget siti ya acha. Achka wa yak tuasigu, has tu acha hayu katangi. Jesu ya duhan tlinget siti ya acha. I wanted you to hear the land, the, the voice of our ancestors speak to you today. This is our ancestral land, mm. and we are still here. Mm. We still speak our language. Atuk siti ha, sehan, ya atwane, tutli an. In our language is love, respect, and kindness. Achkawe, has to tuasi guun ha, iukatangi tletli sek auk, iukatangi tletli sek auk, adatu tankwan. Don't forget your language. Don't forget your language. Put your mind upon it. From there you will know and learn what a real man is. Meaning not only just a male, but as human beings. There is so much that can be said, and I'm like my brother Bob over there. I'm, I, I'm a young elder, maybe not so young, but I'm, I don't feel like I'm what, I'm, what age I am. <laughs> I can probably outrun most of you here. <laughs> <laughs> Just like uh, the, the guy that on TV with the big hat. No brag, just fact. <laughs> <laughs> but see, we, the colonization, how things are, we learn some good humorous things to, to help us to be resilient because humor is one of our resiliences. That even though we are in pain, we still enjoy each other's company. We still cry with each other. We still laugh with each other. She's my granddaughter. Her grandfather was my clan brother. That's why she's my granddaughter. And I have another one over here. And I have another. But he's not. Where is he? He's standing there. He's someone to look up to. 
but he's Kachadi. But we were the same clan. We migrated out of the same area. But I want to say what you've talked about, I shared with her yesterday, and I shared with her. I don't want to sound abrasive. I don't want to say sound condemning. But I want to say it in a way that help us to heal, to understand each other. Because I come from a generation that's very old. My grandfather, which is my dad's dad, was born in 1836. How many years ago is that? Come on, you mathematicians. Somewhere around 185 years ago. That was my grandfather. You say, how could that be? In our ways, sometimes a, a younger lady had to marry, marry into another, to marry a clan leader, which she may have lost her husband. So he inherited her. And he was 28 years older than she was. She was still a young lady, so that's the reason why I'm here today. The first child is born in 1887. Jim Marks, my dad's brother. And my dad was born in 1902, and he was the youngest in the family. If he was alive today, he'd be 116 years old. So when I see all of you here, I think of my ancestors and how they would want to speak to you and how they would want you to, to know. We are so proud of you. We are so proud that what you're doing and the work that you're working towards is what we've always wanted and we wanted to work towards and tried to work towards for the time that uh, colonization came upon us, trying to educate them when they think they were trying to educate us. And yes, we faced a lot of trauma. Maybe Leona doesn't remember this, and I'm trying to respect your time, but I think it's important. Our clan, the Kwakari clan, was up in Haynes area, and an elder told a story that when they put the fort up there, A lot of our women were not found. Sometimes they were found. They were washed up on the beach, wrapped in seaweed. Sometimes they couldn't find the women, so they'd search for them and look for them. And they'd find them in the forest, naked, dead. Sometimes they wouldn't find our women, and they would ship them off down south to become whores. That's the reason why there's not too many Tlingit or Tlokwakaris anymore because it killed off all our women. How do you reconcile that? How do you find justice in that? In closing, What does that word mean, Ishan? is talking about E means no good. Shan is your brain. Hus is them. There's something wrong with their thinking. And so there's a lot of things our ancestors never shared with us, our grandparents, because of all the hardship they had to go through. But yet it was still passed on to us post-traumatic stress. And in closing, I have nephews, nephew and niece who are half Filipino. My oldest sister married a Filipino. And your story brought connection for me, reconciled a lot of misunderstandings for me. And I want to say thank you for your words and, your, and how you brought it across and how that it's healing. Like my friend Bob said, I feel like a better man today because I can accept some things that I have never knew how to accept before. Thank you for listening. Okay, this will be the last one, and then we're going to transition. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stand over here. Hi, my name is David, and 
um, these words that EJ spoke spoke directly to my heart because as the words flew out of his mouth, it was as if everything that I've ever lost come back to me. <laughs> and so I'm grateful that you brought that, you know, that you gave me back that power that I was missing because, uh, yeah, I thought I, for a long time, I thought, um, I, you know, I came to terms with what I had lost, what, you know, my struggles, but it just reminded me that there, there was still something that I was, you know, that was hurting. <laughs> um, and I can only imagine how other people or other men, other Filipino men that have gone through the same experience, to hear, to hear that and connect with that, um, to know that they're not alone. I think for a long time, I have seeked heroes and maybe for the first time, I found someone who looks like me. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad my brother got to be loved up because he gives a lot of himself. You could feel it. I know that you experienced it in what he shared today. And he's like this in spaces all over our world. And so I'm, I'm thankful that the love that he puts into the world was just gifted back to him in this space. I want to acknowledge that and honor that. I also want to say that usually when we put together an agenda, we do not put times. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. We don't like to be constricted by a very Western mindset of time because we slow down and we do what needs to be done in the time it needs to be done. And we're doing that. So I want to acknowledge that the way that it looks, the flow in the agenda, as we said yesterday, is malleable. It will continue to shift. So I just want to, to honor that and say we needed to do what we just did and to express my gratitude to each of you for sharing with all of us what you have because it was a gift for all of us. I will ask Kunmigu to let you know what it is that we're going to do next, what our plan is um, for the next transition. And just because it would feel wrong to not say anything after the, the powerful words that were shared, I just want to take a second to honor everyone in this room who just shared, put their, put their whole self into this morning. What a blessing it was to hear you all. And I'm still, I'm still vibrating from the feeling in the air. And I know that you can all feel it too. And I, I feel really cleansed. I feel really the, the best way for me to describe how I'm feeling is I feel so cleansed and I feel so healed at the love that just poured out into this room. So for being here and making this possible, I just wanted to honor you all for a, for a minute. 